Hi there everyone and welcome back to another simple science video and in this video to continue our ICT system series we're going to be looking at a different type of hardware known as read-only memory so from our previous videos we've explored uh, what an ICT system is and we've started to go into what hardware is and specifically the major types of hardware okay so as we've isolated internal hardware we've looked at CPUs HDDs and SD SSDs also known as storage or internal storage we've also got RAM so we've explored these three in the previous video now we're going to be looking at this fella here and that's ROM ROM as I said before is designed to store configuration data for computer systems it is in a permanent sense whereby the data is literally burnt into the chip and it's not designed to be rewritten, especially rewritten often. Okay, so if we looked at the two different types of memory or storage that we discussed in the previous video, RAM and HDD and SSDs or internal storage, um, these two types of um, memories can easily be mistaken in that people can mistake that HDDs and SSDs or internal storage is a type of read-only memory because RAM is random access memory. They are not because internal storage can be rewritten at a very, very frequent rate. I mean, that's how we create new files. That's how we edit new things into our internal storage. So like how you can edit a Word document and save it frequently, or perhaps when you play a game and it auto saves, it makes very, very frequent writes onto the internal storage, HDDs and SSDs. Okay, so this, as a result, is not read-only memory just because it's different from RAM. This is uh, um, something that people can get their tongue to stick with. Okay, so when we're looking at ROM, we're looking at a very, very special device. But in fact, we don't really interact directly with ROM very, very often, or we don't get exposed to ROM uh, in our daily user activities when we're using a computer. So ROM is a type of non-volatile electronic storage that is built in, typically built into a device during manufacturing. So every single device that you have or know of has ROM. And the reason why it has ROM is because it's meant to store data that shouldn't be electronically modified after manufacture. So as I said before, configuration data, things that are, uh, that are so important and so inherent to a device that it should not be changed, okay? The type of software that this type of hardware, ROM, stores is known as firmware. And firmware, by definition, is a type of software that needs to be hardwired into integrated circuits. In other words, this hardware is hardwired into ROM. And we're talking about, we're going to be talking about how firmware can be hardwired into ROM, but um, we'll get there. So ROM typically comes with the motherboard. So when you purchase a motherboard, say from Asus or Gigabyte or MSI, it contains ROM. It contains the ROM chip. It comes with the motherboard and it describes the IT system, okay? So the way in which you can look at ROM is basically just like how ROM stores configuration data or inherent data of a system, so things that can't be changed. It's similar to how the nucleus of a cell stores DNA. DNA is something that describes the entire system, okay? And the nucleus stores the DNA. And DNA, on the nucleus at least, is not allowing things to change the DNA information, you know? DNA is not something that should be frequently changed or changed at all, okay? So it's just like in ROM to the nucleus and the data that it stores, the configuration data, is similar to DNA. So that's a very, very good analogy for you to picture and relate ROM to. Now, the firmware that ROM stores is typically known as BIOS or UEFI uh, data, okay? But traditionally, it's known as BIOS of a computer system. And BIOS essentially contains a script or a procedure known as bootstrap. 
And Bootstrap is a type of computer program that takes or guides the computer system from power on through a series of steps before the operating system loads. Okay? Typically, this procedure, most of us would simply ignore it. I mean, when you're loading up a MacBook, it's so quick and it's so smooth and automatic that you don't even recognize it or you don't even really care about it. And that's, and that's why, as I said before, we barely interact with the data or the procedures that are laid out and executed by ROM. Okay, so just so you know, ROM stores BIOS, which describes something called a bootstrap, which takes a computer through this process of starting up. Okay, so the bootstrap steps more specifically include the two activities. Firstly, is hardware initialization. So the moment you turn on a computer, hardware is checked and health checked and make sure that it can operate properly. So that's hardware initialization. And the second thing is providing the runtime for operating systems. So just like how games, like perhaps RuneScape, requires a Java runtime, your operating system, which is a, a program, requires a runtime and that runtime is specified by the ROM. So ROM is something that really is underlying everything that you interact with, but you don't really interact directly with ROM. You you're always using whatever comes out of the ROM. It's a very it's a easily the most important piece of hardware. One of the most of course the CPUs arguably the most important, but ROM is one of the most important pieces of an of uh, hardware in your computer system okay so this bootstrapping process um, let's look at what you typically see so let's say you're using a Windows system um, BIOS programs are pre-installed into ROM and they're self-starting as I said before and is the first program to run when a computer is turned on okay it automatically turns uh, it automatically runs. So when you turn on a computer, typically you'd see this this interface here, and that's essentially what is run by ROM. And when you simply sit and do nothing, in other words, you don't press the um, the F options that this screen lays out here, you'll be automatically guided through a process, a, a a loading process that that leads to the operating system or Windows login page okay so this process is typically automatic but if you do choose to press one of the function keys uh, in the BIOS page it will take you to a BIOS configuration page where you can configure um, directly the hardware in a, in, in a manual sense okay, this is typically the very the very well-known blue screen that you can go in and configure um, essentially hardware you're configuring the interaction between your device and your uh, the devices that are attached to your motherboard okay so these are typically for your nerds to to go in and set up things like raid arrays perhaps so this is what you see okay but what tip what actually happens in during this this boot sequence is essentially the BIOS is sending instructions to the the CPU from the ROM yes sorry BIOS instructions are passed from the ROM to the CPU and the CPU loads that information onto the RAM to execute programs and the next step is to wait for a valid boot disk to be found okay so operating systems run off some type of boot disk some, some type of storage it could be a USB device, any kind of storage, but typically it's an internal boot disk storage such as a hard disk drive that contains a disk image uh, of the operating system. Okay, And once that boot disk is found, the operating system is loaded and takes control of the CPU and you're presented with a Windows login page as we mentioned before. So this is how the ROM interacts with the entire computer system at the start. Okay? It passes instruction to the CPU. And in order to be such a strong base, the ROM has to have read-only 
attribute, okay? Now, there are three types of ROM that you need to know about. The first is PROM, or Programmable Read-Only Memory. The next is Erasable Programmable Read-Only Memory. And the final one, which is the most commonly found one in industry, and that is Electrically Erasable Programmable Read-Only Memory, or EEPROM. Okay, and we're going to be discussing and talking about how these technologies differ and it's mainly to do with the erasability and updatability. Okay, so firstly you have PROM, and that is a type of memory that can only be programmed once. So the moment that the, the hardware, the physical piece that you see here is manufactured from the factory, it can only be burnt and programmed once. Okay, and once it's written to or programmed, the information is permanent. It cannot be changed or deleted, and, we'll talk, and I'll show you how. Okay, so when PROM is first created, all of the bits that are stored in all of the data cells within PROM are all ones. Okay, and when you attempt to make a change for the first and only time, you use an electrical current and you apply it to the specific data cells of ones that you would like to convert into zeros. At the end of the day, information and data is ones and zeros, with bits of ones and zeros, okay? And in order to change um, a 1 into a 0 for PROM, you ha electrically have to blow the fuses at the positions where the 1s need to be turned into zeros. So you, this is how we write onto PROM in a permanent sense. So once you blow a fuse, you can't really unblow a fuse. And this process is essentially called burning. And you hear this so often. You're burning into a chip and some things that are burnt in colloquial terms, you know, you, you can't unburn anything, can you? So that's how you essentially write permanently to PROM. And therefore, we kind of alter the, the data in PROM. And PROM is primarily used in the past to store BIOS information for early, early computer systems, okay? So this is for early computers. The next technology you have is called EEPROM, electrical, Electrically Programmable Read-Only Memory. And these are easily recognizable due to their transparent um, fused quart window on the top of the chip. So these exp allow for the chip to be exposed to ultraviolet light when erasing. So uh, essentially, in order to electrically change the data on an EEPROM, you need to expose it to uh, ultraviolet light. And this essentially erases away um, the data so that you can go ahead and reprogram it, okay? It does not use um, burning um, like PROM or traditional ROM. It uses ultraviolet light to erase, which you can then go ahead and program. It is more commonly found, obviously, than PROM because it allows manufacturers and users to reprogram the chip by erasing it. Okay, so this was a huge breakthrough that came out after PROM. And then you've got EEPROM or E squared PROM. And it's a type of ROM that uh, can be erased and reprogrammed using electrical charge. Okay, so um, just like the previous EEPROM, you can erase it, but you're using a different way to erase it. Instead of using ultraviolet light, you're using something that's much more more common and actually um, usable within circuit. In other words, electrical charge is um, uh, you can you can get electrical charge with this thing stuck in the motherboard because the motherboard is powered by a PSU unit. Don't forget. Okay, so EEPROM consists of an array of floating gate transistors. So transistors, as you know, they react um, to a type of electrical charge. Okay, and EEPROM is designed to store relatively small amount of data, where literally individual bytes can be erased and programmed. So we're looking at um, it's it's a physically smaller chip, and it stores smaller amounts of data. So in order to achieve the same things with PROM and uh, EEPROM, you need to have more of these EEPROMs, okay? And the thing about them is that they allow for quicker writes 
and it allows for more granular um, erasing and reprogramming. So a very, very uh, common type of EEPROM is flash memory. Believe it or not, things like your USB and your SSD, uh, sorry, your SD cards, they are a type of ROM. They're a type of EEPROM that allows for high speed and high density data access and storage, okay? But unfortunately, this comes at a cost of large erase blocks in that um, compared to regular EEPROM, you can't delete at such a granular level such as um, one byte, okay? There are larger erase blocks, but also you also have limited write cycles. So after a, uh, a certain number of write cycles, suppose you say 100,000 or 10,000 for a lot of devices, the life of the device actually degrades, okay? So um, flash memory, there is a trade-off, but the, the benefit that you get out of flash memory for its high speed and such, such compact um, data storage um, feature really, really makes it a huge sell. So um, EEPROM is obviously, as I said, found the most commonly in industry. It's found on modern, uh, modern motherboards and it's mainly to store BIOS, okay? Because BIOS is something that needs to be accessed, accessed quickly and accessed effectively. Um, but um, because it's stored on flash memory, it can't be uh, used to store things that require, that essentially require more granular and smaller updates such as parameters and history. And as a result, flash memory is only used to store, to store BIOS for booting. And smaller EEPROMs, as a result, need to be used in order to store parameters and history, okay? So, as I said, EEPROM is used very commonly in industry, in all commercial products. But there are ty two types of EEPROM, and that's flash memory and smaller EEPROMs. And you need to n understand how these two differ and how you can find them. So I've created this um, little ROM cheat sheet that is derived from pdia.com uh, that will sim simply summarize um, the different PROM technologies and how they differ in terms of their erasability and reprogrammability. Okay, so I hope this has been useful and I look forward to seeing uh, you guys uh, give me some comments, any questions, and I hope to address them as soon as possible. I hope this was a simple and effective uh, lesson for you all. Thank you.